All right, so uh, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. I'm glad you guys are all here. Uh, I'm Joe Tomei. I'm a lecturer in law here at the law school and a senior fellow at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Uh, and so welcome. I just want to say really quickly, uh, in addition to Nick's wonderful talk today, we have several other wonderful talks, the rest of this academic calendar. I'll just mention the two that are uh, this fall, uh, and then I'll tell you where to find information about the others. On November 7th, Alan Nislov, a professor and associate dean, uh, of undergraduate program at Corey College of Computer Sciences will be here on November 7th. Uh, on November 14th, we have Brian Sachs, who's the CISO for the state of Indiana. Uh, and then there are five more coming up in the spring. Uh, if you're interested to uh, learn more about these, if you just do a Google search for IU, CACR Speaker Series, you will quickly find this information. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce Nick and then I'll let him take the floor. So uh, Nick Guggenberger is a clinical lecturer in law a research scholar in law, and the executive director of the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. His research focuses on the intersection of law and technology, specifically platform regulation, privacy, the automation of law, and the future of private law. Nick has frequently served as an expert witness and on advisory committees, mainly on matters relating to financial technology, financial markets, regulation, digital policy, and media law. So let's give uh, Nick a warm welcome. Well, thank you so much for this kind of introduction and thank you also for the great opportunity um, to come to Bloomington. Uh, Bloomington, I really appreciate it. Um, first of all, this is a very early stage uh, paper. This is very early stage work. So if there's something in the slides that you find incomprehensible or the, where you that you might want to challenge, please do so right when we're there, ask me questions, point out mistakes, tell me where I'm wrong. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate any sort of other feedback. If you have additional tips, where to look at, where to research deeper, this is all much appreciated. So, so don't be shy. Please interrupt me when, uh, when you think, uh, when, you, when you have additional ideas. Thank you very much again for this kind introduction. So, let me, um, I, um, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak to you today about online tragedies. Online tragedies are the basic framework um, in which I want to explain that the, legal, that the legal framework that governs social media and communication platforms today is insufficient for systemic reasons. And the goal for today is to convince you that the legal framework is ins insufficient for systemic reasons, that it cannot work out, even if it were to be de de designed perfectly according to the general line that we have taken when it comes to uh, regulating digital platforms. Instead, I want to suggest that we uh, pursue a sort of an invent environmental law approach to regulating the digital public sphere. I want to suggest that we should look beyond user control and beyond the individual user's interest. This is my goal for today. Let's see whether I can live up to that. Um, to start off, um, my basic premise is that the core of the problem of of the various problems that we see with um, communication platforms at the moment is their business model. And building on that, I suggest that if we look for solutions, for solutions to the present challenges that online communication platforms pose, we again should and have to look at the business model and how to potentially redesign that business model. But please give me the opportunity to quickly lay out the, um, an outline for the next, uh, for the next what, 50 minutes, 45 minutes I have. Um, um, and I want, to, I want to start off by describing the basic business model, um, how it is rooted in surveillance capitalism and what impact um, it has on communication online. I want to I want to, with a rather broad brush, go through the regulatory environment and the present regulatory discourse that um, has been put in place or that is discussed at the moment. And um, in closing, I want to suggest an alternative route 
towards what I would refer to as resource management. Let's start off with a fantastic book that came out earlier this year. It's probably been mentioned in a couple talks. <laughs> They've made it probably into a couple slides, but if you haven't had the opportunity um, to open up that book, I really recommend it. It is such a fantastic deep dive into the functioning of the economic order that has, uh, that has, um, that has developed around digital communication platforms specifically, but uh, around digital and the data-driven driven economy more generally. Shoshana Subov in her, what is a 700-page book, describes a, what she calls a new economic order as surveillance capitalism, which she defines, well, she provides like 15 definitions or so, but one of the definitions, the first definition that she provides is it is a new economic order that claims human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. The basic notion is, she says, that digital platforms commodify our experience, commodify our experience, and resell our experience in the form of data. And this is the economic model that I refer to um, when describing the business model of the leading um, online communication platforms, and this is more, this is more or less my, my starting point. But I want to dive a bit deeper into the, the business model of the leading online communication platforms. Um, this was in 2018. I don't know whether you remember the Senate hearing when, um, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg smirked at the senators and said, well, Senator, we run ads. The context was this. Um, Senator Orrin Hedge, Republican from Utah, asked, well, if so, um, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Mark Zuckerberg again smirked at him and said, well, Senator, we run ads. Now, there are multiple interpretations of this exchange. One like easy way to look at it is kind of to, to smile at it and be like, well, this is a rather old gentleman who might not have followed the last couple of years of, um, of the development of digital platforms. But there's also an other inter a different interpretation, which is um, assuming that he wasn't the only one preparing those questions and that others looked over these questions as well before they were posed. Maybe there's slightly more to it. Maybe it is a sort of a challenge to, um, to Mark Zuckerberg to explain his business model. That would be a more positive connotation of that question. Well, however, however it may be, we will never find out. But this is the description of Mark Zuckerberg himself of how fa Facebook functions. Um, I think there's slightly more to it, and I want to, I want to go into that slightly more of it. So one part of the ad section is that um, online communication platforms capture attention. They capture attention, attention with whatever gimmick they offer. They might offer, they might offer a communication messaging app. They might offer a platform like Instagram something that captures your attention, or they could be offering a stupid pink bunny. Now they resell that attention that they have captured to their true customers, to uh, various large brands, but also potentially smaller advertisers. This is a very obvious part of the business model. The next part of the business model, um, and honestly, I don't know whether why whenever you search an image for data, you always get something that looks sort of scary. This is what happened to me. So the <laughs> other part of the business model is purely data-driven. That means that um, online communication platforms collect data and directly give others access to that data, resell that data. This is another part of the business model, one that Mark Zuckerberg in his smirking answer did not mention, but that does play a role in the financing of online communication platforms. Of course, not only Facebook. I sometimes use Facebook or refer to Facebook sort of as a prototype, but you can really plug in everything there, whether it is Google or whether it is an app that runs um, on top of Facebook, whether it is a dating app, whatever it is. This is a second element of most of the leading communication platforms. And then there's a, there's a third element, which 
I distinct from the other two, which is prediction. Prediction is sort of derivative data. So you could also refer to it as, as, as data because what you're providing is actually information, is data, but it, is, it requires a processing in between. So you're not reselling what somebody provides to you, but you're processing, you're computing something, and you're selling the results, the conclusions, basically. This is the third element which um, describes most of, the, um, most of the business models that we see online. Now, there's been this long debate around what's free on the internet and what's not, and that there's no such thing as a free lunch and so on. I don't necessarily want to dive into that debate. What I want to dive into are the consequences, irrespective of whether we call that, um, we call that compensation for the services um, or not. I want to look at what, what real world results do we see that seem to correlate with these business models. Again, I'm in the following, not necessarily alleging causation for every single one of them. All I'm saying is that there is correlation and that there is some reason to believe that at least some of these consequences are actually caused by the business model, that there is a probability that they are caused. And so if we look at the various side effects, we can group them. We can group them in in, I suggest, three categories. One is the category of autonomy, and we will go in, into each of these categories a bit further. The, another, and the next one is physical and mental integrity, and the third one is the public sphere, more generally speaking, the functioning of the public sphere, the functioning of the democratic discourse. So if we go into, if we go into these um, um, in more, more detail, um, and if we look into the first, uh, the first bucket, the first bucket that I uh, labeled autonomy, then we see that, and we split that up, then we can identify that there's an element of privacy, there's an element of seclusion or independence, individual independence, and then there's, the, there's this feeling, but on an individual level, a feeling, a potential feeling of surveillance and intrusion that does not necessarily need to correlate 100% with the actual loss of privacy or with the actual loss of independence. It is the perception of the loss that matters in this, in this third category. Um, if we look at the, second, at the second bucket, the physical and mental integrity, then we see signs of addiction, social media addiction, um, people spending, and this is maybe a Maybe, maybe addiction is too much to say, but people spending more time on apps, on digital devices, than they rationally would like to if they could plan for the future. This is like addictions up there and this next level is down there maybe. But people overspending time, so to say, overspending compared to what they would if they could plan the future. Um, we see um, signs of decreasing attention spans, um, uh, especially among youth, there is evidence of um, negative impact of constant distraction by digital devices and by certain, certain applications. There are signs and there's certain evidence of constant stress posed by those applications. And ironically, the largest network of friends seems to produce a feeling of loneliness among certain people, a feeling of loneliness in, in their real world. Now, again, I'm not alleging that this applies to everyone. I'm certainly not alleging that everybody who uses Facebook will feel lonely. What I'm saying is that there's evidence, uh, that there's strong evidence of correlation, and that there's some evidence of causation there. But again, I can't, I couldn't say I can prove causation with respect to every single one of them. But that, for the larger picture, for the conclusions I want to draw, might not even be necessary. Um, this is a bit more convoluted. So what I'm trying to lay out here is that um, with respect to the public sphere, with respect to the democratic discourse, we also see certain side effects 
that seem to stem, um, or at least we can reasonably assume that they have a connection with um, social media and <coughs> online communication platforms. First is polarization. The first is polarization. So if you haven't seen it, look up this beautiful video by Trevor Noah and his Daily Show, um, where he shows a more or less empty bar with two sad people sitting at the um, sitting at the bar, and the bartender thinks about how to how to be more appealing, how to get people in, well, basically how to make more money, how to sell more drinks. So what the barkeeper does is the barkeeper starts a fight between the two of them. Um, now, people walking by outside the bar, they hear that fight and they start flocking in. And the more people flock in, the louder that fight becomes and the barkeeper is incredibly happy, sells lots of tons of drinks and beer and keeps stirring that fight, keeps pouring oil into the fire. More people walk by, it becomes louder and louder and attracts more and more people. Now, that video was supposed to exemplify the incentive structure behind Facebook and other online communication platforms. There is an incentive to stir polarization because stirring polarization uh, captures attention. It captures our attention in a very natural way, and it allows platforms to sell more of that attention. So this bar is more or less just an example or the incentive structure that the uh, bartender has as an example of the incentive structure that everybody who runs a social media platform based on advertising revenues also has. The natural effect of that is, to a certain extent at least, political polarization. Um, another element is the potential destruction of the common public. With common public, I mean the um, common set of facts, the basis of every sort of democratic deliberation and discussion, um, and that relates to the granularity of the provision of content online. Um, if you provide content in a very efficient way, you present it in a very granular way. You tailor it to the individual. You don't speak to groups anymore, you speak to individuals. That can have negative impact on the common public. You have to speak about truth. Truth with respect to that? Yeah. I am speaking of the possibility that you can make it easier to create different truths or facts. If you want to distinguish, <laughs> how do you distinguish fact and truth? They should be pretty close to the same. They should be, very, they should be in line. They should be parallel. A fact should be true. I, I agree with that, but how do you, how, like in, in your question, you, you suggest, you, your question suggested that you see a difference. Yeah, that, it's what they call fake news. Uh -huh. Back in 1984, uh, what's his name, we had to do reconstruction of all the papers because uh, he's changed reality. Uh, and they call it the Ministry of Truth. Yeah. Well, this is taking it very far. Uh, but, um, but um, I would say there are certain elements of that that um, endanger a common set of a common set of facts in which discussion can build. Yes. Now, this question reminded me of something. I'm pointing out negative side effects here. I don't want to be a downer. Um, social media and online communication platforms have created immense positive externalities have connected people, have lowered the cost of speech, have allowed us to connect with, uh, with friends all over the globe. I don't want to focus on these things. I recognize them. I don't want to focus on them uh, in, this, in this conversation, but just, just for background. Next one is there's potentially, or there is a potential of a depletion of attention. With a depletion of attention, I don't mean the literal depletion, that there is no attention left. What I mean is that um, we might see a situation at which attention becomes so scarce and therefore so expensive that, um, that certain democratic processes that take free attention for granted for the functioning of the process might find it harder to function in a world in which a high percentage of attention has been commodified, has been sold off. We see 
hate crimes. Again, there is no, not necessarily a provable causation, but there is certainly correlation between the emergence of hate crimes online and the success of online, business, uh, of online communication platforms. We see um, elements of discrimination and bias. We see false information. I don't, didn't want to call it fake news. False information that, that, uh, that, has, been, that has been spread um, online. We see um, extreme content. An example of that is um, YouTube and its algorithm that seems to lead people to more extreme content if they just follow the suggestions that YouTube provides. Again, there's an incentive behind that because if you provide more extreme content, there's a higher probability that people will stay on the platform, spend more time, therefore be exposed to more advertising, therefore create more revenue for the, for the platform. Um, now, I want to segue into the regulatory environment in which these platforms operate and want to try to match whether this regulatory framework and the regulatory discourse lives up or at least addresses the types, the types of side effects that we see that we see online. I want to start off with rights-based privacy and data protection frameworks, as they are probably the most comprehensive approach to regulating online communication platforms. So there's the GDPR in Europe and the uh, CCPA in California, which uh, has not gone fully enforced, but we can already see it outlined. Those are both rights-based frameworks. To various degrees, they require consent um, for certain processing of personal data. They give individuals rights. They give individual rights to either contradict or they require individuals to consent to the processing of data. They give individuals information rights, transparency rights. They give individuals to varying degrees rights to have information deleted. That has, been, that, has, that has been processed before. So they are, they are a great example of rights-based frameworks. Individuals are in power. Now, whether or not those frameworks actually have, um, have a theoretical or a philosophical basis in the natural rights of individuals, or whether these frameworks only use individual rights as a tool for creating sort of a data management structure um, that is contested, but doesn't really matter for this debate. For this debate, it matters that they create rights that users have to invoke, that users have to invoke, and, and that's the important part, that users can also waive. There is no requirement that I that I require a social media platform to delete my information at any point. I can do that. I don't have to do that. I don't have to invoke any of these rights. And based on my consent, I can consent to more or less everything. There is no limitation. That's the very nature of a rights-based framework. Now, without that, we have um, frameworks that are based on notice, um, uh, notice consent and contracts. Um, uh, um, notice and choice is the standard American model. Um, consent is the older German and uh, continental European model. And we have an overlap between these data protection or privacy protection frameworks and contract law. Contract law, again, requiring certain, a certain element of consent, if you want to call it consent in that in, in, in that context for creating this relationship between a platform and a user, and depending on the jurisdiction, you then do have an enforceable contract or you do not. Um, transparency rights are oftentimes based off as uh, part of these rights-based frameworks, and then, of course, as a catch-all, you, ca you have tort law and other forms of liability, again, depending on the jurisdiction in question. That's the first and probably most important 
pillar of the regulatory framework governing online platforms, um, online communication platforms. Then you have a second pillar that is well just emerging, I would say, um, and this second pillar um, is platform governance or private governance and what some have referred to as new school speech regulation. Private governance describes the community standards set by the platforms themselves. This is a form of private rule setting. Depending on what platform you sign up, you sign up to certain community standards that might reflect um, the laws and rules in that jurisdiction or simply the choices that that platform has made. Usually it is a blend of the two. Usually the legal framework is basically the starting point and the community standards tend to be stricter than, a lot stricter actually, than what's required by law. And that is something you can see in the US but also, also abroad. Um, you have, and this is just beginning, you have private due process or at least the attempt towards cre creating private due process within these platforms, and you have an element of internal constitutionalization. Um, and that is something you see happening within Facebook at the moment, where Facebook um, aims to create what they call or refer to as a Supreme Court to decide or ultimately decide over content moderation decisions. And then this is an example that I picked because it was probably the first um, the first type of an actual um, new school speech regulation law aimed at content moderation. This is an example from Germany, the so-called Network Enforcement Act, that where um, the state required platforms to remove what the law refers to as illegal content within um, 24 hours or seven, uh, or, seven, uh, or seven days, respectively, depending on what kind of content it is. Now, this is the state mandating a platform to exercise its content moderation power in a certain way. That is a significant deviation from what we know from 230 CDA or the European Union equivalent in 14 of the e-commerce directive. Um, this is the state actively requiring, not just placing a liability if you don't do something, but actively requiring platforms to engage in a certain type of speech moderation. Um, these various um, approaches, whether it is private due process, community standards, or this new school speech regulation, are all aimed at certain symptoms that we were a, that we that that were identified on platforms and are targeted to fight false the spread of false information to spread to um, um, fight certain content that is perceived to be undesirable um, for various reasons and um, <laughs> to enforce defamation libel and slander laws in jurisdictions where such laws exist. The next pillar, the third pillar, is what I would refer to as relationship governance. Relationship governance. That is something that goes beyond, that goes beyond the notice um, and choice or the consent framework. Why? Because it governs the relationship between the platform and the user, irrespective of and beyond the individual consent. So that means that I am limited in what I can consent to. Think of that as the relationship between a lawyer and his client, the doctor and uh, her patient, a, um, an accountant and her client, and so on. Um, the framework um, usually was proposed under the buzzword information fiduciary, or sometimes has been referred to as privacy or data as trust. And the idea here is that platforms have certain fiduciary duties towards their users not to do certain things, not to violate their duty of care, most importantly, not to violate their duty of loyalty against, the, um, against their users. And the prototype that people propose in those frameworks 
um, uh, that the, uh, the prototype that they have in mind is the Cambridge Analytical Scandal, where they would argue that this is the prime example of a violation of users' trust in the integrity um, of the data processing. This is where the information fiduciaries have violated their fiduciary duties. So if we replace, if we mentally replace the, uh, the, the platform by an attorney or by a doctor or by an accountant, that doctor, accountant, or lawyer would certainly not have been allowed to share the information with Cambridge Analytica. And be, why? Because that would not have been in the best interest of the user. That would not have been the best interest of the user. And therefore, they argue that this is the framework that we need to pursue um, in order to make sure that platforms act, do act in the best interest of the user. Now the GDPR, to pick an example of an already existing framework, oh, this is basically to capture and resell attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and to distract you from the real content. Here. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. All right. Um, so the, um, the GDPR. I distracted myself. <laughs> what a great result. Um, so the GDPR has certain elements, has certain elements of this, uh, of something that is close to a fiduciary duty. And I specifically only say certain elements um, because, um, because those are only vague principles. Those are only vague principles that are not really spelled out and not quantified at all. Yet, one can argue that they limit the ability to consent to platform behavior in a certain way. So there's the principle of fairness. A platform is required and is held to a standard of fairness. You can't consent to unfair practices. There is a principle of data minimization, which compares the benefits from the data processing with the intrusion of privacy and more or less states as an abstract principle that the platform, that the data processor, has to follow a process that reduces, that reduces the intrusion, that reduces the, um, uh, uh, that it reduces the impact of the data processing on the individual. And then the next one is that, according to the GDPR, the consent is not only a formal consent, so it's not sufficient to only check a box and like have 20 pages of general terms and conditions in the background. It needs to be informed consent. So the user needs to actually understand what, what she consents to. So this informed part is a limitation of what you can consent to. You cannot consent, or put it differently, your consent would be invalid um, and therefore irrelevant not justifying if it is not informed consent. And there are other limitations, there are other limitations to consenting away one's privacy that are enshrined in the GDPR, yet most of them are abstract principles, and yet most of them can be adhered to by simply changing the procedure and not the material result. So you, for example, the informed consent, if you just follow the steps, if you, have, um, um, if you have the right privacy policy in place, then you can actually engage in whatever data processing you do want to engage in. You just have to clarify it. So this is a transparency, um, a transparency requirement, yet a transparency requirement that is tied to the validity of the consent. Another um, aspect that limits um, the ability to consent away one's privacy and to consent away, one's attention, so to say, is, and this is again a European principle that would not apply here, the uh, horizontal application of constitutional rights, where, um, where courts in the EU have argued that, um, have argued that when, um, when uh, examining the general terms and conditions of online communication platforms, they have to read into those um, general terms and conditions, and into the laws that govern those general terms and conditions, the constitutional guarantees um, of privacy and the freedom of expression. 
And reading in those constitutional guarantees can limit the platforms in what they can actually put into their general terms and conditions. There are further options. Um, those are mere suggestions that have been circulated that I would group in, uh, uh, in this category of relationship governance that would limit or at least, um, or at least change the relationship between the individual and the platform and in, in a certain way also limit the, the contractual freedom, so to say, not contractual in legal sense necessarily because sometimes it's not an enforceable contract, but the, um, the, the freedom to transact in that relationship by, statute, by requiring, for example, an option to pay. So um, the idea here is that the user should be given an opportunity to instead of being exposed to advertisements and instead of having her privacy exploited, to pay a subscription fee as an alternative. Another idea is to uh, um, conceptualize data as labor and, um, um, and compensate users um, for, their, for, the, for providing their data and making that compensation mandatory in a way that you can't necessarily opt out, but that you have to be compensated for what you're contributing to the platform. Um, those things, mandatory compensation and data as labor, those can be combined, those don't necessarily have to be combined. Another, another way to play this data as labor idea is to simply say an individual has a right to demand compensation, but again can sign that away. Those those are all the, all the aspects that I would summarize under relationship governance. And then the fourth pillar, the fourth pillar that has become um, very, um, very much talked about recently, especially in the political sphere, um, have been reforms to the market structure. The basic analysis there is that we have a monopoly problem um, we have a monopoly problem that stems either from the lax enforcement of antitrust rules over the last um, 20, 30 years, or it stems from the nature of those networks, um, meaning outside network effects that contribute to a very high degree of concentration within a short period of time. And there are various suggestions in here in, in, uh, within that bucket that range from we need to break up tech companies to we need to ensure the interoperability and the ability of users to uh, migrate their data from one provider to another to requiring social media platforms or platforms at large to open up their APIs and um, by doing so, allowing for more competition. The basic notion is here that the problem, the real problem behind, behind many of these side effects is a lack of competition. If you believe in that, then this is a viable way to go. If you don't, if you disagree with that, and if you think that competition will not solve it or will not solve it entirely, then this is a route that you can combine with other initiatives but will not be sufficient. Now, um, I think that all of these four pillars have significant shortcomings. They have significant shortcomings because they don't address the incentives, the conflicts of interest, especially the conflicts of interest between the platform and society at large. They don't address the um, externalities, meaning the third party effects. They don't protect common goods such as the public sphere or such as the conception of privacy as a common good. I also believe that they disregard changes in technology and the structure of communication and the shifting scarcities within the communicative process. They disregard that, cheap, that speech has become so much cheaper than uh, um, in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. They disregard that attention has become so much more expensive um, or scarce since the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And, they, and that re specifically relates to the European approaches. They disregard the negative impacts 
um, the negative implications on state mandated um, uh, or uh, state mandated um, moderation rule or private privately designed moderation rules that in my view also have their own negative impact on the factual ability to speak freely. So what I want to provide, I want to provide two examples of these, um, of these types of externalities to give you a better understanding of what I mean that these regulations do not address externalities. So this is a 23andMe kit. Um, this is this company that analyzes your um, DNA and then allows you to trace your roots back, or at least that's what they promise. Um, and on top of that, um, you can then feed the information that you get into a large database, and you might find relatives and lost siblings and lost half-siblings um, that you might be happy to learn about or not. Um, but you can do that. So this very concept is based on the idea that it's completely fine if I do that. Why? Because I consent to that. I want my DNA to be, um, to be analyzed. I want to put my data into that large database. Well, that interpretation, and that relates back to the rights-based frameworks, that interpretation disregards the fact that if I consent to that, that doesn't mean that my cousin, my dad, my grandmother, my, my sister consented to that, yet they are impacted. Because if, if I provide this, if, if I have myself tested, and if I provide that information and put it into a database, well, a large portion of my sister's DNA and my brother's DNA and my parents' DNA is disclosed as well. So if they find some... Uh, some, uh, um, some, uh, some hereditary ail ailment in there, there's a high likelihood that my immediate family has the same, and people can draw conclusions from that. Insurance companies might be interested in the fact that if I have that, well, there might be a 50-50 chance that, and now I'm bad in genetics, but that some of my relatives have that as well. There might be a 25% chance, but that 25% chance is relevant. It impacts them. It doesn't only impact me. So I have disclosed and intruded in their privacy, not only in mine. Another aspect of this is the following. So you can have yourself tested, and you can, have, you can upload that to a large database. Those databases will grow larger and larger. Um, by now, they have millions, millions of data. So what you can now do is with a with nothing but a DNA sample, you have a very, very high probability to identify an individual. Nothing else, just the DNA. You don't have a name, you don't have an address, you don't have the region, speaking within the United States, but you don't have the region, nothing. Why is that? Well, there's a high likelihood that some distant relative took that test, uploaded their data, and now we know the identity of the grandma and maybe the second cousin. Well, what's easier than just driving there and asking them who the second cousin and who the second grandchild is. So what individuals have provided, individuals have provided the ability to identify almost every other person simply by their DNA trace and therefore have probably, um, therefore have significantly limited the amount of privacy and the privacy that other people, that's a classic third party um, effect. Second third party effect is this one. Um, does anybody remember the story to that? Uh, the fitness trackers, the military base. Yes, exactly. Those are the fitness trackers. Um, I'm, I'm one of the polluter, polluters as well. So um, this is an air base, and uh, soldiers wearing fitness trackers ran around the air base. And by doing so and by uploading the data, they disclosed the exact shape of that air base, which was considered... Um, information that's relevant to national security. And again, rights-based frameworks don't help with that. Why? Well, the soldiers themselves, they were probably unaware that they are creating that, but um, they, were, they consented. They were fine with that. They wanted Fitbit to record that. The company did 
everything that was required from them. They asked users, well, do you want that to be recorded? Do you want that to be uploaded? And everybody said yes. The problem is that the soldiers um, working together with the company Fitbit disclosed information about that airbase. That's a classic third-party impact. The Air Force, the military, was not asked whether they want that, yet they were impacted. Another example of a third-party impact that is not addressed by rights-based frameworks or by any of the other pillars that I mentioned. Um, this is a great paper. I think it's probably coming out soon. This is um, on the privacy and externalities of, of data. They argue that this is a very, very natural phenomenon. Um, and this can be explained um, without any insights into modern behavioral science, but simply um, explained with rational actors. That is because an individual might have an incentive to share her data, and it might be rational for that individual to share her data with a platform. Why? Because she receives services that are, more, that are worth more than the data she shares that are worth more than the data she shares. So it's completely rational to use Facebook and give up, give up, uh, give up, it's completely rational for me to use Facebook and give up my data. Why? Because the data for Facebook is worth more in a social context than it is worth to me as an individual. Now the social value of data, the purely social value of data is nothing but an externality. Because that means that this is not something that impacts my privacy, but this is something that allows Facebook to draw conclusions from the aggregate data um, upon others. So it is completely rational for me to share my data in exchange for, for, for services. Um, why? Because I offload externalities on other users and on not only users, but other individuals, more broadly speaking. So what I suggest is that instead of relying on rights-based frameworks mainly and these other three pillars of platform regulation, I suggest that we should look at um, other areas of law where we're dealing with externalities, and we should um, look at environmental law specifically for solutions that go beyond individual consent and individual control. Um, we should take into account the incentive structure, and we should take into account the changing scarcity. All elements that are present um, in, in, in environmental law and that drive the regulatory agenda there. So if you haven't noticed, I mean, this is very close to the debate around uh, climate, ch climate change, global warming, and the concentrations of CO2 in the emission that have become, in the atmosphere that have, to, that have become too high. So what we need to do is we need to look out and identify common goods um, that are potentially overexploited, and we need to think about ways and means for an effective management of resources, an effective management of resources. We can borrow from environmental law here. So this is the classic tragedy of the commons here, of course. But we can also look at, um, at, uh, at other areas of environmental regulation or the regulation of common goods, more generally speaking, whether that is clean water or an atmosphere that allows um, for uh, that, an, a sustainable management of the atmosphere. First, my goal is to define a positive agenda not only to point out pollutants and say this is, this is a danger, but to define a positive agenda of what we should safeguard, what we should value, what we should protect. And I suggest three elements of that. First is a private, the privacy as a common good, meaning addressing the privacy tragedy. Second is identifying attention as a common good. And um, that goes back to what I would what I describe as an attention strategy. And the third one, and this one I'm saying, this is very much a piece in progress. This is a tragedy around predictions and uh, behavioral manipulations. And this is something I haven't fully been able to wrap my head around yet, and I'm still working on. Um, but 
But let me focus, since we've already talked about privacy, let me focus on the last uh, eight minutes on uh, um, the attention tragedy part. So I already uh, mentioned a potential for the depletion of attention. For the depletion of attention. Now, don't take that literally. Of course, we're not running out of attention. But democracy requires a certain amount of freely or very cheaply available attention. The least thing that we need to contribute is we need to vote on a recurring basis. And we need to have enough people that vote. Now, this is, of course, only the bare minimum. We also need people to participate in public discourse. <clears throat> and we need lots of people to participate in public discourse. We need people to run for office. We probably don't want to pay anyone a full wage in order to run for the school board. We probably don't want to pay and probably couldn't pay people to, to, to participate in public discourse, especially on a local level. Now, if you take these things, that adds up. That's more than just going out to vote once every four years on a national level. This is much more. So there's a certain stock of attention, if that is the quantifiable thing, <laughs> that democracy needs to live up, a sustainable level of attention that democracy needs. Now, if we have ever more effective ways and means to exploit, to commodify, to commercialize, and to sell off attention, then this stock of attention that we need for democracy to function is endangered. My point is not to say that this is like two hours a day that we need to save. This is more of a theoretical concept, saying that there is a certain amount, and if we continue to commodify it, we will eventually reach a point where, um, the sustain, where we don't have a sustainable level of common attention or um, societal attention anymore. Where exactly that point is, whether we have already reached it or whether we have already gone beyond it, is something that is incredibly hard to quantify and something I don't even want to attempt. What I want to point out is that that point does exist and that we need to think about that point and that we need to think about policies that address the fact that we have potentially gone over um, the edge in that sense. And the other aspect of the attention tragedy that I want to point out is something that can be um, explained maybe best with oil drilling and the practice of the capture of attention. So if you harvest resources in the beginning, it is very easy. You know, you just drill into the ground, you find oil, and it's not very intrusive. It's not very intrusive. The scarcer the resource becomes, and the more like um, easily accessible oil fields uh, deplete, the more you have to engage in intrusive practices. You have to, if you want to continue to produce oil, of course, that's the basic assumption here, you have to engage in offshore drilling, in fracking, in more environmentally, certainly more dangerous, more intrusive practices. The very same is true for attention. When attention, when there is an, when there is an um, over-provision of attention, it is very easy to get somebody's attention. If you're sitting in a dark room, a snap might be enough to get your attention. If you're in a roller coaster in an amusement park, it takes much more. I need to be much more intrusive to get your attention. Now, if we continue to commodify attention and sell off attention, and if we have already scraped off the attention that we can easily get, we have to employ, deploy, more intrusive practices. So while in the age of television, it might have been enough to show everybody the same commercial with that according level of intrusion over TV, that might not be, necessary, that might not be sufficient anymore. Maybe now I have to tailor it to get your attention. Maybe now I have to catch you in a vulnerable moment to uh, expose you 
to the appropriate advertising for the drug curing the disease that I know that you have just gone to the doctor for. This is certainly more intrusive with respect to the individual autonomy and, and privacy. So the scarcer the resource becomes, the more intrusive my practices um, have to become. So we have two aspects of this attention tragedy. One is the depletion under sustainable levels, and the second one is it becomes more intrusive as it becomes scarcer, and the, um, the process of harvesting the attention becomes um, intrusive in itself. The prediction tragedy, as I said, this is a um, early piece in, pro uh, piece, uh, piece in progress and more than happy for any comments around that. I'm yet not entirely sure how to, uh, how to, how to frame that, whether I should frame that around very abstract uh, concepts of autonomy as human experience. I think that's not that helpful. I've been thinking about um, framing the uh, prediction tragedy around the efficiency and the functioning of markets, where we rely on the aggregate information of, indiv of individual decisions that are independent from each other, aggregated through the market, or whether I want to go down a path where I say um, it is actually the uncertainty itself that has a common dimension to it and that can be overexploited. This is something that I'm still working on, and any leads or suggestions are much appreciated in this area. So I'll we'll come um, to the end. Um, what I think we need is I think we need to think beyond control, user control, and beyond consent. I am convinced <laughs> that that is not sufficient because there are incentives for the individual to overshare, to pay too much attention to certain, um, to certain things, to have one's attention commodified and commercially exploited. And so the rights-based frameworks are, on a systemic level, are not sufficient to address these challenges. So what I suggest is that we need to look at and consider um, quantitative restrictions and limitations in the hard way of control and command regulation. We could think about or look back at bandwidth management. Um, we could think about or should think about um, pricing attention, potentially taxing advertisement revenues where people will be in taxes because they tend to have certain externalities that cannot be taken care of for private law. Um, we might think about subsidizing the public sphere, other types of information. We might think about um, adding other incentives to, to work in order to move to more subscription models and less advertisement-based models. We could think about reviving all the principles um, around what sometimes have been called data frugality. That's a continental European principle that um, more or less said that you should design um, an, an, a process so that it reduces the least amount of data. That might not be up to speed anymore. Maybe we have to rethink that. But other than the privacy by design network, it doesn't necessarily weigh the advantage to the individual user with the impact on the individual user, it is more of an absolute concept. So it's an absolute limit, or not a quantitative limit, but like a principle thing. You should, on an absolute level, limit your processing of personal data. And I think last but not least, it is essential to invest in digital education and to spread the word that the consent and the participation in certain practices does not only impact ourselves, but does impact others as well. So um, thank you very much. Much looking forward to the discussion, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, if you have questions afterwards or comments afterwards, do reach out by email, Twitter, however you wish. I'm also a victim of the um, digital economy, and thank you very much. <laughs> Time.
time. This is scheduled to end at one, so I'm just going to, you know, kind of give a formal ending here. If people want to stay and ask some questions, that that's perfectly fine as well. I thought I had. Oh, did I did I over over? No, no, no. Okay, I just in case people need. To okay, call, we no, no, I also hope you guys enjoyed the light show as part of our new uh, <laughs> series. Um, but again, uh, a round of applause for Nick, and if people want to stay and ask questions, please do. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. that data. 
it still needs to be provided with the data. So it needs an individual that, um, that, that shares her data with Facebook. Now imagine a jurisdiction in which we have a property right in data. So we say, my, my, um, and not speaking about copyright here, so let's speak about information that would not be copyrightable. Um, simple, simple fact. That I was that I am in Bloomington today. Let's say I have a property right of what sort of what whatever sort in this information in this data. Now, what Facebook would say? Well, if you want to use our platform, um, and if you want to make that information accessible or shared with your friends, you need to sign over your property right. So, what's going to be my choice? What's the difference? There is no difference. Of course, I'm going to sign it over. I have a property right, but I will trade it, and I will give it up, and the, 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 the transaction, what I receive for that, will be exactly the same, whether or not I had a property right to start up with. And that is just one example of two different conceptualizations of what data could be or could mean, but I don't think they, they change much in terms of the, in terms of the um, in terms of the transaction on the individual level, and also they don't change much in terms of their societal impact. Or uh, two is questions. I mean, one on privacy and one on attention. Uh, on the privacy front, I'm a little bit more familiar with. My overarching question is basically just: Does the fund, does the existing system? not work or has it just not worked yet? Because uh, some of the examples you raised were sort of like, there's a new technology, we have a new problem that we weren't expecting, but then we kind of deal with it. I know maybe it takes us longer than we would like, but we, we get somewhere done. Because I think like in the antitrust world, I don't even know if we've really tried antitrust in a meaningful way in the tech world. We're talking about it, but we haven't really done anything. So maybe that is the solution and we haven't tried it. Well, and, and on the attention front, I just wonder how much is on the social media platforms and like the internet commerce world, and how much is just phones? And how much is? It's, how much is just phones? Like the fact that we have smartphones on us. Yes. Um, so to the first question, um, could it work? Has it not yet worked? Will it ever work? Um, I think no because it cannot work from a, from a theoretical point of view. So it would be a dysfunction if it works. Um, a rights-based framework as well as um, enforcing or as well as, a, as antitrust, which is there to promote competition, um, by design cannot take, off, cannot take care of external effects. There is, it, like, it theoretically cannot work. Or I let's, 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 let's allow me to walk back from that. I would, from a systemic perspective, not expect it to work. But look at the two, um, the private, uh, the rights-based framework. Um, well, if it is in my best interest to give up my data, meaning assuming rational actors, well, I'll continue to do that. And if I impact others, again, assuming assuming rational actors in an economic sense, well, I'll continue doing that. So the rights-based framework will not necessarily help. The competition framework is maybe a bit, um, is maybe a bit, a bit harder to brush off. Um, the competition framework, uh, um, <coughs> that assumes that if, instead of having one large Facebook to take a break off, break up example, I have 10 small Facebooks or three small Facebooks, smaller Facebooks, and um, now I have to ask myself, would that significantly change the incentive structure um, between the users and the platform? Now, one hope is, of course, that they would compete over privacy, among other things. Or um, they would compete over showing mass advertisements, among other things. Over advertisements, potentially it could have some, some effect. Um, some effects, I say, because I think oversharing attention is also something that not only harms you but harms others. 
But with privacy, it becomes, I think, even more, even clearer, and that is that, again, assuming rational actors, if I get more servers, then I pay in data, I will do the same with three small Facebook. Um, on top of that, the breakup might have, um, might not even lead to three small Facebooks, but might lead to two years of three small Facebooks, and then everybody will migrate to one Facebook again because of the network effect. So um, while I am personally much in favor of tougher antitrust enforcement for other reasons, I don't think it solves this problem. There's talk around um, enforcing antitrust rules not at the platform level, but at the advertisement level. So at the ad network level, the matching between matching between users and, and brands, not necessarily the platform. Yet the distinction is sometimes artificial because it all is Facebook or all is Google, but it's a different level. And um, um, and within that level, the hope is that um, if there's more competition, um, then first of all, advertisers um, pay lower prices, but also maybe consumers um, are not exploited in the way they are now. Again, I think there's a very similar spiel at play where um, the individual still has an incentive um, to trade in um, their privacy, their attention for services because they can offer external things. Now, I took out a pen and a paper, but I was too late for your second question. What was that again? Oh, it was just how much is uh, like digital media generally versus the fact that we have phones? Because I mean, it's not just like Facebook. I, I think it's inseparable. I think I think it's uh, I think it's inseparable and. Um, so um, I take that as a suggestion. Maybe I shouldn't talk as much about online platforms, but maybe I should talk more broadly about um, uh, about the digital economy. It makes the, it would make the article which I'm still writing probably even um, even less focused. So I'm I'm not sure whether I, I whether I can do that, but I, I agree. Yes, I, it's acceptable. Um, I just wondered about in your um, harms around autonomy, you did not include agency, personal agency. And I'm just wondering if that was specifically left out or just if you had considered it, because I think that's a huge harm for that. Thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, this is something I should, should spell out much more clearly. Maybe, maybe this is a concept that I um, have already read into the into the heading itself without without further spelling it out, but point fully taken. I should elaborate on on that more. And uh, Shoshana Zuboff has a lot on agency in her book. And yes, um, point well taken. Thank you for the. I, this is something I should should make a lot clearer in the talk. Yes. Well, last qu oh, oh, two more questions. You and then Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I was reading an article about algorithms can be biased. They were talking about uh, predicting where crime will happen. But on the same level, uh, Amy Webb wrote a book, Big Time, where she talks about uh, tribes, that the, these large companies have tribes where they, the brain drain they get from certain universities and are predominantly male. So it's kind of the bias with predictions at the same time looking at the people who are really writing these algorithms. Being may come from maybe certain universities, and in fact, that it's male dominated. Would that have something to do with a, you know, this prediction tragedy of messing up with a, where they're going? Well, again, a point I should definitely elaborate on. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a long answer now, sorry. But, so uh, I, I'm. I generally don't necessarily believe in biased algorithms, but biased structures that are reflected by algorithms. Um, so I don't necessarily think that the design of 